This is the Quantum Biology Podcast, where we break down the practical health applications of this emerging science, starting with healthy light habits and going wherever the quantum superhighway takes us. In this episode, master conditioning coach Jim Laird and Jackie Jolie, an animal expert who's certified in applied quantum biology, cover 20 years of lessons learned in the health and fitness world. This is a hilarious and intimate conversation between longtime friends as they share the ups and downs of their journey to wholeness. Good day to you. My name is Jim Laird, and I am going to be your host for today's podcast. I work, if you don't know who I am, I've been a strength and conditioning coach for about 25 years, and I currently work for Dr. Stillman. Uh, I am his accountability hammer type object. I make sure people do what they're supposed to do. And joining me today is my good friend uh, and co-host this evening, Miss Jackie Jolie. Miss Jolie, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Hey, everybody. We're going to have some fun tonight with this podcast. Uh, Jim Laird and I have known each other for close to 20 years, so it's going to be a lot of fun to collaborate together tonight. Um, I am a recent cohort graduate of the Quantum Biology Collective Uh, quantum health practitioner program, uh, level one. And I've had that for about a year now. And I've been in the quantum field of practicing a healthy light life for the last three years, and really tried to get out and share that story and share that information through holding local seminars at yoga studios or health clinics. Um, And then my full time big girl job is I do body work on horses for a living and I've done that for about 10 years. And it's actually very interesting how some of that kind of combines together with the health that we need with having a healthy light life. And uh, we'll dive into some of that tonight as well. Thank you, Ms. Shirley. Um, Ms. Shirley, 20 years ago, 20 years for me, five years for you, uh, we met. And why don't you talk a little bit about kind of where you were in your life at the time that we met and uh, all that good stuff. Oh my goodness. I almost feel like this is like confessionals. (laughs) Uh, So I was your typical college student, broke female who still wanted to, you know, look good and be skinny and do all the things, go to school, have a job, have a life, be social. Um, And I thought I was doing all the things that like you were supposed to do. Um, I was running and doing a crap load of cardio that I hated but I was doing it because I thought, well, this is how you stay skinny and stay healthy. Um, I snacked throughout the day, you know, chips and salsa, apples and peanut butter, like a protein bar, protein shake, Um, didn't really engage in lots of fats and proteins, Um, never did any type of weightlifting, Um, just lots of cardio and thought that that was the right way to do it until, and I was, you know, I thought I was healthy. You know, when you're young, you can get through with a lot of that stuff and get away with it. And then I stepped into a CrossFit gym for the first time ever and met this lovely meathead here, Jim Laird. And he was like, what are you doing with your life? (laughs) You are going to run into a brick wall like sooner than later. Um, I have worked with women after women after women that are especially usually significantly older than I was. And they had already gone through thyroid issues or autoimmune disorders or, you know, couldn't get weight off. Um, And they had done kind of the same things I had done, like not eating or just snacking or doing a lot of cardio and killing yourselves in the gym, along with killing yourselves as a female out in life, like giving all the time and doing everything and being superwoman. And he was like, I can help you. You know, you seem like you're tired all the time and you should get into weightlifting and you need to eat more. And I was like, "Mm, I I don't know about all this. (laughs) Uh, But I've definitely been a person in my life of always being curious, needing to be challenged, um, and sometimes needing a leadership role to hold me accountable. And sometimes people don't show up that way, especially the way Mr. Laird did. And so he's like, come on, just come work out with me. Like, I'll show you the ropes. We'll get you started. Just give me 30 days of, of my program. And I was like, okay, but you have to do everything I say. Okay. (laughs) So about 30 days later, 15 pounds heavier, (laughs) I was like, what is going on? Like I'm poor. I cannot afford another wardrobe. I am tight in my clothes. When is this going to change? Like 
I think I'm just going to go back to eating my bananas. But in that process, I had noticed a couple of things. I actually really enjoyed the weightlifting. Um, it was challenging. It made me feel strong. It gave me empowerment. I also noticed that I didn't have to do it every day. Like I was running every day that I hated. Um, and with the weight gain, he was like, just give it, give it 30 more days. It's going to change. Your metabolism has to change from eating carbs and sugars all the time to protein and fats and lifting weights. And gosh, darn it. Mr. Laird was right. <laughs> so the pounds started coming off. I started getting like tone and like abs and I was thrusting chains with my glutes on a bench and just felt like a badass. <laughs> So I officially fell in love with weightlifting. Um, I got to eat like whole foods with like steak and bacon and we would go have lunch and he's like, put some butter on that, put some more butter, eat some more bacon. And I was like, what? This guy is letting me eat like all this fat and protein. Okay. And um, it also helped me just in the uh, trust and intuition of really giving something a go and jumping all the way in and trusting the process and knowing that also it was gonna take some time and Laird held my little hummingbird wings the whole way and allowed me to just get focused and just stay consistent. Um, and even on days, sometimes I came in and it was that time of the month and I was like, I'm freaking white. And he's like, okay, let's just foam roll. And I was like, what? Like, we gotta wait, we gotta lift weights. I gotta like keep up with like the skinniness and the strength. No, 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 you need to chill and you need to foam roll and that's all you're gonna do today. I say so. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it really worked. And I needed to learn that those processes came in place that was the healthiest for how my cycles worked as a woman, how my hormones worked, how I could weight lift two or three times a week. And that's all I had to do. But I did need to make sure that I also rested and refueled the proper ways. Um, so that's how we initially met. Laird might have some little differences in that story. But what that has to do with quantum health is we fast forward maybe 10 years and I was still focused on a paleo lifestyle, lifting weights, riding horses, um, all of those things. And they were keeping me healthy. We just didn't know the light component, of course, of all of that, of being healthy and strong. And so unfortunately with me living a very poor light life for almost two decades, I ended up with Lyme disease uh, five years ago now. And Laird and I, I lived in a different state by this point. And so we always checked in on each other and we were finally catching up with one another. And I told him I had Lyme disease. And he was like, dude, you've got to check into this Jack Cruz guy and this quantum health stuff. He's like, Jackie, I know that I led you really right the majority of the way with everything that we've learned so far. And he's like, but I didn't know about this light factor and it is gold. And I was like, of course, by then I knew that he always had my best interest at heart. And I was like, okay, like send me the information. What's it about? And he's like, I'm pretty sure he's talked about something with Lyme disease before, you know, look into it. And so I was already doing some natural healing for the Lyme disease initially anyways. And I started looking at the cruise information and the light and, and quantum biology. And a lot of it was way over my head, but kind of the nature part of it, of getting out in the sunlight, um, kind of stuck. But to be honest, since I worked on horses already at that moment, I was like, but I am outside all the time. Like I, I should be healthy. I still don't understand. I didn't know the rules of nature about the sunrise. And luckily at that time, Cruz did have like a group meeting coming up in July and Laird was going to come into town for it. And um, he's like, you should come with me. And I was like, okay, yeah, that would be great. And that's when everything was sold. Um, I met Meredith that time and um, it all really clicked because you had so many human beings around you that were like-minded. Everybody had a journey or story like mine. I mean, Laird has also gone through health issues that the light life has now changed for him. And so when you see everybody else's stories and journeys and it all just resonates with you and feels so right, um, it was the same thing with the weightlifting and the paleo, like you felt it, you started seeing results. And as I changed my light life again, it was, it's still a process, but 30, 60, 90 days, which is nothing. I was seeing so many compounding results that I was like, this is it. Like, oh my gosh. And of course I'm so thankful to Laird for that, uh, gift. And, um, that's kind of our story. We're almost 20 years down the road and here we are on a podcast for Quantum Biology Collective and having fun, sharing the message. Well, I appreciate you basically giving my resume, which pretty much my entire career has been 
mentoring and coaching very strong willed driven females. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I think one of the golden things that you can get out of this is, you know, I kind of started in the same sort of way. I was training really heavy, uh, working long hours and I stumbled across, you know, I ended up getting ulcerative colitis and I studied, I studied, I stumbled across Paul Check. And at that time, Paul Check was the right person for me here because he told me, he said, in order to work out, you must work in. And that's what I needed to hear at this time. And, you know, there's so much division in this um, quantum health or keto or paleo or whatever. And then Rob Wolf was a big part of me getting my health in order. Those were the messengers I needed to hear at the time, right? So everybody's so divided with their message, like, don't listen to this person, that person's wrong. You know, a lot of people are really hard on Andrew Huberman. Um, does he get everything right? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But he's telling millions of people he's got a mainstream massive following to go outside in the morning, right? If we could get 60% of the United States just to go outside every morning for 10 minutes, it'd be a different country. Absolutely. So my point being is, is Rob Wolf, Paul Check were the right people for me to learn about stress management, to learn about changing my diet. Um, Paul Check helped me learn about dealing with anger issues that I had had that was the reason I was just killing myself in the gym. Um, and I needed to forgive some people and put that behind me. That was the right message. And then I was able to convey that message to Miss Jolie. And then later on down the road, I ran into more health issues because I was a zoo animal. I was inside from five in the morning till eight at night. And Dr. Cruz hit me over the head with a sledgehammer. <laughs> and I changed my lifestyle. I needed Dr. Cruz at that time. So everyone in this space has, I, I, I compare Dr. Cruz to like the, Southern Baptist altar call minister. And some people need that message. But some people need like Mark Sisson to just talk about eliminating processed foods and walking out or even Stan Efforting, who's a bodybuilder, walk outside three times a day. Everybody's at a different place. And it, it's kind of like, I'm not going to go religious here, but the parable that Jesus talks about spreading the wheat and the seed in the field. Some seed falls on the uh, on the thorns, some falls on the path, others fall on fertile soil. Different seeds need different things at certain times. And I think people get into this quantum field and they get so rigid in their information and so caught up in the dogma that they forget that everybody's in a different place. And all the different clients that I work with, some need a little more um, acceptance and help. Other people need a come to Jesus. And so it's about giving people what they need and meeting them where they are and allowing them to discover, like Miss Jolie did, she discovered what she needed and she ran with it. I led her to the door and she ran through it. And I think a lot of coaches turn into a televangelist instead of just giving them the information and saying, hey, this is the path. You can walk down it if you want to. And the path goes into some rabbit holes, right? You might not need to go into any of those rabbit holes. You might only need to do a few simple things to get you where you want to be. But, um, you know, Jackie's story is, is, I think, very good for people to hear because everybody has, and all the clients I work with, sometimes it takes a year or two of me repeating myself over and over again. I'm really struggling. I'm not doing well. Have you been going outside? No. Okay. Start with 10 minutes outside in the morning. Do that for a month. Get back to me. Well, I'm doing much better now. You know what? The dude's crazy. But I started walking outside three times a day. I feel better. I don't crave as much garbage. He's been telling me to eat protein for two years. Maybe I should start doing that. You know? So that's kind of the kind of the approach that 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 I take with this. And um, you know, it, it, I'm just it's great that Jackie now is able to help other people because both of us um, have very strong personalities, um, obviously. And, uh, but both of us love helping people and love meeting them where they are. <laughs> about that interruption there. That was your, that was your time limit, by the way, Valor said enough, Jim Laird talking. <laughs> you, you talked, you talked more than I did, sweetheart. I put a timer on it. 
I'm just messing with you. It's a great message though. And something I used to always love, not really necessarily believe in the beginning when we were working together, but I was like, can it really be that simple? You know, he'd be like, you just need some simpleness, you know, and just this heavy lifting weight consistently, you know, three times a week and just try that and see how you feel. And it really does come down to that. I think almost everybody we know in this space has gone through a disease or an illness or they're stressed or they're tired. And we've lived in a society where it's always more, more, more like this supplement. Oh, that didn't work. Add on this supplement. Oh, that didn't work. Another supplement. Oh, well, maybe go see this doctor. No, 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 no. Oh, you need this doctor over here. And then people end up with this long slew list of things that they feel they have to do to even just try to feel normal. And it's super overwhelming, exhausting. It doesn't, as we all know, and most of us find out, it doesn't end up working. And I think that's also what makes it so hard for when we come to the message of like, just go outside, just, just try the sunrise for a couple of days. And people are like, nah, like that's not going to do anything. <laughs> I have this whole list of all this stuff over here that I have to do and it's not working. So how could it possibly be the sunrise? Um, but I think as all of us know so far as practitioners and people that have been trying this, we've already felt the differences and the few people or the multitudes of people that have started trying it. I have messages now in my inbox too, of just like, thank you. Thank you so much for even just the sunrise message because my energy is up and I feel better and I have more energy for my family. You know, I've had men write me and say, I have energy for my, my wife, you know, just messages like that that just are so impactful and of course just fill my heart up with so much gratitude and once me it gets me to keep doing what I want to do and I know you're the exact same way um and it's so great to be able to just break down those small messages of people will listen but luckily we just continue to just try to spread that seed like you said and some are going to grab onto it some might not until a year later <laughs> um but it does work and it's really nice to be able to have that and have this community that supports and i think the people appreciate that too they know you're still there saying i'm holding you accountable and when you finally feel the difference i'm going to be here to celebrate with you and support you and we'll keep going I, I think the struggle is mainly is that most people don't realize that our modern world is by design designed to pull us away from nature if you go back even to 1970 and you look at beach pictures in 1970 or pictures from Woodstock, mm -hmm. there were no obese people, none. Half those people didn't work out. Women in the 1950s, 60s, it was unfeminine. Marilyn Monroe was one of the first women to actually strength train. Mm -hmm. And what did they do? They spent a lot of time outside. They didn't eat the garbage that we eat now. They made most of their food from scratch. They mowed their grass. They lived an active lifestyle. They went to the beach. They spent tons of time outside. They didn't have screens. Mm -hmm. So our number one battle is look at the awesome technology that allows us to have this conversation and to help as many people as we can is how do we balance being in touch with nature with the convenience of modern life? And that is the battle and it's going to get bad. I'm positive about it because I choose now. I used to, I'm, I'm a huge history nerd. Uh, I study, I read um, history. I read more things that I should, but I'm not going to let the negativity and the, um, for the first time in history, there's technology that will allow tyranny to survive and thrive. In the past, there wasn't enough KGB agents. There wasn't enough um, intelligence agents. You couldn't kill enough people to keep messages suppressed. But now they in the switch, the flip of a button, they can do that. So my main job, one, is to be joyful and, and, and not get caught up in the things that I can't control and, and to help people find the balance for themselves so they can use the new system without the system using them. And that's half the battle is getting people to be self-aware enough and to slow down enough that they don't become a complacent, compliant consumer, right? Yeah. And that modern life does not rob us. And one of the things that really hit me over the head in the last couple of months was I spent a lot of time in, in South and Central America and Nicaragua and just the joy that just watching these people that have nothing, they like have an ox cart, and the children playing soccer with a rolled up T-shirt with duct tape. 
and the laughter. And I thought to myself, when's the last time I saw that in the United States? I see parents yelling at their children at a soccer game. I don't see any laughter. I see kids getting upset and swearing and punching the ground. Just the sheer joy, the simplicity that these people had in their lives. Half of them didn't have air conditioning. And I was like, you know, I'm not going to let this machine affect the way I feel and the way I live my life. And that was a big moment for me. I'm going to be aware of everything that's happening. And I'm going to share everything that's happening with people so they can decide for themselves. But I'm going to make sure that I don't let that negativity affect my ability to connect with nature and to help other people. And I think that's something that is very difficult today with the propaganda and the constant um, indoctrination. Um, Jackie, why don't you talk a little bit about your journey as far as working through your past history and emotional stuff and getting yourself into a place where you're able to sit quietly because you're like me um, in a way, you know, if you give me an ax and you tell me to cut down two trees, I'm going to cut down the two trees and I'm going to look at it and go, there's a whole forest here and I've got this ax and I've got nothing to do but cut down trees. I'm not going to cut the whole thing down. Right. Yeah. And, and I used that for years as a way to not deal with the shit in my closet, right? I didn't want to deal with those voices in my head because it's painful and it's not easy. So I just continued to cut down trees until I ran out of trees to cut down. Why don't you talk a little bit about some of the stuff that I know you've been through in, you know, relationships and family dynamic and, and all that sort of stuff? We're truly turning this into the confessionals. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for sharing your part of that as well. I'm really proud of you, friend, for getting through a lot of that. Um, it's interesting, the last couple of months, too, I've had some breakthroughs with, you know, with our whole quantum theory and the light story. It truly is the foundation of everything that exists on this planet within us, within the plants, the animals, and we're all connected with it. Um, but there's really been a big signal of like the emotions are really running the show, um, which if you want to get into really esoteric stuff, I mean, emotions would still be energy, which energy is still light. So there's still that base light foundation there, but man, the emotion part, it is not easy. Um, and all of us come with all kinds of backgrounds and family stuff. And so we all have stuff. Um, so obviously we're not here, you know, being on our high tail or anything like that, but, um, yeah, I mean, I've had my fair share of some family dynamics and failed relationships and all of those type of things. I will say where the quantum comes in and helps so much. Um, obviously we know the scientific side of it, of light on your gut helps you with your dopamine and your serotonin. And so you're going to feel good and you're going to be stronger and all the physiological effects that we now learn on the science side and also feel it when we're doing this life. The thing that I didn't really expect was going to happen after you see all the physiological stuff is I had a better ability of coping mechanisms. So instead of falling into the trap of laying on the couch and just been watching Netflix all day long, feeling sorry for myself or whatever, if I was going through something stressful or to allow some of those distractions to come through, I go plant myself out on the grass under the sun and I'm able to lay there for 20, 30 minutes to an hour sometimes. And I don't even realize how fast the time goes by and I'm able to be still. Cause like you, I've been the same. I'm definitely strong headed and disciplined and motivated, which is all good things. But I kept myself really busy to keep myself distracted, to not deal with the inner, like when you said, Paul check, like sometimes to work on the out, you have to work on the in. Um, and it really does help that nature will just settle you and calm you. Um, I think like in the psychological, um, psychology realm right now, there's a lot of talk on like our nervous systems and that our vagus nerves and some of that gets out of whack. And even with working on animals, I've already learned a lot of that just from being a body worker for animals. And now it's like, oh, all of that's coming forward in the human realm of like, my nervous system has been on fight or flight for over probably two decades, more than it's ever been in rest and digest. And granted, I had people like Laird every now and then like, okay, Jackie, we need to just chill and foam roll and you need to bring yourself down. 
So in those moments you could, but we should be able to naturally get into that mode very easily. And I have to say that nature helps that so just automatically. Um, I know now, and I actually had a really, a lot of stress towards the end of last year, things that I couldn't control that were out of that realm. And um, it was still very stressful for me, but one, I was able to handle it in a much more calm state, calm tones, not losing my emotions and getting into screaming matches and things like that with people that I love. And even after the fact, when I came home from everything that had happened, I just realized I needed to do all the things to fill up my battery again, my redox or my energy battery, but on that emotional side, because my body was just drained completely, even though I already live a good light life, right? So I was taking myself hiking with my dogs for two or three hours and automatically your nervous system is just relaxed. It is finally, your body's just able to go and you should be able to get into that state more than the other way around. So when there's you get- uh, there's actually research where they show people pictures of nature and it reduces their stress. Yeah. So what actually happens when you get out in nature? And that is the thing that modern life has stolen from us is that connection with nature and that calming effect yeah. And as and I'm here, I'm going back from the Bible again. I'm sounding like a evangelical, but it says in Psalms, be still and know. And there's wonderful power in silence. Mm. And if you look at Jesus, who's the, you know, the center point of the New Testament and of Christianity, here is some is someone who is presented as the son of God is going off by himself into the mountains to be silent. Okay. And our modern world has robbed us of that. So if you can incorporate quiet time in nature, it's an automatic reset. And if you look at the phone, if you look at a casino, if you look at these things, it's designed to get you fired up in this dopaminergic circle where you need more dopamine and you need more dopamine and you need more dopamine. And then you start acting like when you're a reptilian brain, you don't have, you start just reacting, you start drinking more, you start just compulsively eating. Your body takes resources away from reproduction and digestion. You start getting stuck in this overbreathing state where you're stuck in this extended position, which is the holy shit, I'm, oh, holy crap, I'm going to die. There goes the explicit thing. You edit that out, hopefully. I'm in extension. I've got to like I, I, I don't have to worry about eat, surviving tomorrow because I'm running from this bear. And our society is designed to get us in this state. And nature is the answer to that. Except most people, the average child today spends four minutes outside a day. Mm-hmm. The average maximum security prisoner gets more time outside than children do today. So it's our job to consciously educate people. And if I can just get somebody to walk outside 10 minutes, three times a day, like it's so simple, Yeah. but I have client after client. Oh, I, I, I woke up. I didn't need a cup of coffee to, to, to get moving. I pushed that cup of coffee off till later. It's amazing. Like I don't feel so rushed. I'm not as stressed. I don't crave potato chips anymore. It's like a pebble in a pond that just Mm. ripples. And we want to make things so complicated, even with exercise. Like people don't understand. Everything in your life is about adaptation, right? And when, when Jackie started lifting, she didn't need to do much when she started, right? And then she just added a little bit on. And, you know, I'll, I'll loop back to one of the things, one of the most crazy things in today's modern world are women that are under eating and overdoing it. Mm -hmm. Um, Burn me alive at the stake, upside down. Men and women are different, okay? Women cannot handle underfed states for long periods of time. Their hormones just go to hell, right? Men are set up to handle more stress. They can handle longer fasts. They can handle harder training. Their endocrine system is harder to mess up. Women are more sensitive to the environment by design so they can pass on that mitochondrial information to their offspring so the offspring has a better chance of surviving in that environment. And that's the way women are designed. And you can burn me alive for that. I'd be happy to be burned alive for that. And 
what people don't understand is that when women are being, you know, they have to be a, a mom, they have to have a career, they have to have this, they have to have that. And then they're trying to starve themselves to look like a supermodel. That destroys women like nothing else. It just mows them down like grass. And it's always better for a woman to have a slight calorie surplus and lift weights and to do moderate amounts of activity. She's going to do, she's going to be much leaner. She's going to look better. She's going to feel better. Her hormone profile is going to be way better than if she starves herself. And that's one of the reasons I trained, you know, I've got tons of women I trained for 10 years. One, they loved eating more food. They loved the fact that they could eat more food because they had more muscle mass. They love the fact that they were powerful and they filled, they filled their clothes out in a way that was enjoyable for them and their partner, preferably. But I like that too, but not in the professional sense, but in the personal sense, right? You're but, all the explicit warnings on this podcast. <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know. I got to be careful. It's late. It's almost, it's almost past my bedtime, right? <laughs> so our world is literally set up pull us into this loop and it's our job to make people aware of how important it is to get out in nature. And I, I'm working with a lady right now, PCOS from, she's from Africa, like direct from Africa. Luckily she, she was in Germany before, luckily she's in Florida, hadn't had a period in two years. And her diet was atrocious. Like I'd say her diet was like 70% orange juice. and we just started with three times outside, protein at every meal. Two months of that, had her first period she had in a year. Nice. That's where she started, right? And so we're gradually educating her a little bit more, a little bit more. And, and that's one of the things about this space. There's, you know, We can go down the EMF rabbit hole too. EMF is important. But when you have someone who doesn't go outside at all, we don't need to dump 5G on them on the first day. <laughs> I start with, the we have five basic pillars in our practice. Walk outside three times a day, which I, I stole from Stan Efforting, the vertical diet. Morning session, most important. I used to just tell people to walk outside, but now I tell them three times a day so they get all the different times of sunlight. Eat a protein at every meal. Most people dramatically under eat protein. If you notice the government's telling you to eat less protein, so whatever the government tells you to do, do the opposite. There's another disclaimer or warning that'll get a flag. Um, drink high quality spring water or preferably reverse, os reverse osmosis water. Water is so important. I mean, we could do a whole show on water, but it, it is, along with your circadian rhythm, the water that you drink is the foundation of your health. Get the lights off at night. Obviously, we've mitigated. I've got my, I do my my stuff on my phone so I can turn my screen red and I turn my red light on at night. And the big one that most people forget is relationships and community. And I'll tell you what, you could live in a Wi-Fi free, cell phone free area with organic food in the middle of nowhere. But if you've got no friends and you got community, you're going to be freaking miserable and you're going to be sick because I did it. So we're a very complex, multifaceted being. And when I approach people, I always talk to people about becoming more resilient, about making the stress tub bathtub bigger. I don't talk about this is killing you, this is killing you, that's killing you. I talk about what can we do to work in to make you more resilient. So if you do have to stay in a hotel that has Wi-Fi, you have the ability to handle it. If you happen to have a mold exposure because you're in a bad apartment, you have the redox to handle it. That's the way I approach it. I approach it from more of a positive thing where I'm like, get outside three times a day, get your feet on the grass, eat high quality foods, eat seasonally. Do all these things, drink high quality water, make yourself as resilient as possible because we as humans, it's amazing how much crap pesticide, you can go into all the garbage that's being done, but people are still unbelievably so reproducing and still living. Like I walk into like Publix or Kroger, even Whole Paycheck, 
And I look around and I'm just like, holy crap. Like, how are these people even surviving? <laughs> you know, or I'll, like when I lived in the panhandle, I'd go to like the, the cold springs there. And I'm looking around and I'm like, that person is still alive. Like, how is that even possible? The human being is so resilient. And if we could just get people to do like a C plus B minus, the world would be a completely different place. We don't have to shoot for A plus. For those people that want to do A plus, go for it. But everybody kind of has to determine, like, for example, I am working with a lady who's pilot, which, as we know in the quantum world, is probably one of the worst. She does transcontinental flights. She flies from Miami to Korea twice a month. Overnight. Probably the worst possible thing she could do for her health. She has mild arthritis, overalls, and general health. She has to fly for two more years. On her own, she's already figured out, we have a place in Panama. I am going to move to Panama when I'm done flying. Great. She's like, my auto, my rheumatoid arthritis goes away in Panama. What can I do to get myself through the next two years? Because I have no other choice. And that's my job as a coach to meet people where they are and then help. Like I had a family who the, the son had alopecia. He was only five. And obviously, I don't treat disease. I just coach people on how to get healthy and everything takes care of itself. Through conversation, and this kid was in front of a screen eight to 10 hours a day and never went outside. And so I, I sat the parents down. I said, look, you know, if you want to help your kid, you need to lead by example. You need to start taking the kid outside. So the kid stood, and the, and the mom said, she's like, I did notice that because I educated her on circadian rhythms and vitamin D and how important it is with autoimmune disease stress bathtub. She goes, you know, we do, I noticed in the summer, he doesn't get symptoms quite as bad. And we're actually thinking about moving to Florida. So she came to that conclusion by me educating her. She came to that conclusion instead of me saying, you need to move to Florida. Mm -hmm. And that way it's her that's compelled to do that instead of me saying, you have to move to Florida. Well, long story short, this young kid cut out the cereals, made his food more simple, you know, lots of eggs, lots of bacon. And the mom was like, well, he doesn't want to eat that stuff. I was like, just let him, you know, he'll eat eventually. Just he skipped like two meals. And then after that, he started eating eggs and blueberries and bacon, never touched the cereal ever again. But he start, she started going outside, limiting his screen time. And she noticed he's like four or five years old. He would choose outside over the screen time, but no one had showed him that. Mm -hmm. And so in this whole space, in our modern world, we're going to need people that lead by example. Instead of preaching to people, you need to do this, you need to move here, and you need to do that, and you need to do this. Lead by example and say, hey, this is what worked for me. Here's the path. Figure it out on your own. Instead of telling them, like, you're going to hell unless you move here or do whatever. It's, it's just kind of a... Um, just a little bit of a different approach. And I'm not saying that that other approach is invalid. There are some people that need to be beat over the head with a hammer, like me. Like, I, I don't think. learn unless, unless, like, I don't learn unless I crash my car into a wall at 100 miles an hour. But luckily, most people are not stubborn like I am. So, um, I don't know. I just, I wanted to share that about being sensitive and leading by example as opposed to just preaching at people. I think it creates like um it creates a safe place for people to you're already kind of questioning what they consider as their normal lifestyle that they don't see a problem with or they kind of seem like well I've gotten to 40 and I'm okay so far um we're already starting to have them question that and say but what about this or what about that I um <laughs> a funny story so I got some micro needling done yesterday which I don't know if people know what that is but they do like a little like tattoo pin of needles on your face to like create micro damage so you can have a nice young face along with getting out in the sun right and obviously this is a what what time is what time of day sun miss Jolie, for skin restoration let well, people know in the morning and in the afternoon with your red and infrared light um, just, just a bracket there like all these people that are like the sun destroys your skin that's because the average well, american only goes out at two o'clock in the afternoon and they don't spend enough time so this dermatologist, now the old Jackie, I would have just not said anything. And I, you know, I almost wanted to kind of ask and have some debates and I'll share why I'm sharing the story. But 
So she knows what I do for a living. And so she's doing my face. And so all of a sudden she goes, well, you're, you're covered up, right? Like when you go out and you work on your horses, you're, you're covered. Right. And I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, well, you know, like you wear a lot of clothing and like you wear sunscreen, right? Like you put sunscreen everywhere. And I was like, no. And she was like, but, but you're covered. Right. And I was like, no, no, no. Like, but I mean, I'm in a barn sometimes, you know? So I mean, like, sometimes I have a roof over my head. She's like, oh, okay. And she's like, but you don't wear sunscreen. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't wear sunscreen. And she like started laughing. And I was like, well, sunscreen gives you cancer. So she started laughing even more. And she's like, well, so does the sun. And I was like, no. <laughs> and I just kept it simple like that, actually. And I didn't feel the need to over explain, which was kind of like new growth for me as well. And um, me too. I was like, well, I was like, <laughs> not if you don't get it in the morning. And she just kind of like chuckled. So I was like, okay, well, she's not open to the conversation. I was kind of just testing to see. But when we do work with like the normal public and just your regular like Joe Smo and their family, it is interesting when you do come from like leading from the example or, you know, like I, we both share a lot of stuff like on our social media posts and things. And it's like just enough with the information that you're putting out when it's not so demanding or preachy and it's just like hey look what I found out and like here's a scientific article to go along with it or I get out and show what I'm doing during the day of getting the sunrise and look how beautiful it is and how happy and positive that energy does come off of that even if it's a social media post and people feel that because as we all have realized you get that curiosity back from the people that want it that that ripple that pebble that you talked about and they'll come back and they'll just come with curiosity so whatever question they ask I'm just there to support that and answer their question and don't say like you should do this or you shouldn't do that like they'll ask well what about on cloudy days you know okay well yeah still go outside the sun is there you're still getting light you know those are great days to go out and just get red light oh okay I had never thought about that and it's right when you shared the story about the kid we're so far along now with our generations unfortunately the generation of like my grandparents you know that lived through the depression was outside all the time with the gardens they're starting to die off. And so now we only have these generations left of modern humans that have been way more indoors and just thought nothing of it. Um, but, you know, when you just start to explain, even like if, if you get somebody that's a history nerd and be like, hey, well, did you know that electricity has really only been around for like 100 years? Like, that's not that long. Did you know pharmaceuticals have only been around for like 100 years? That's really not that long for how long us as a species have been around connected to daylight all day long you know and if you get another history buff well did you know about the Hazda tribes and tribes that are still hunter gatherers out in Africa that like don't have diabetes and don't have skin cancer and they're outside all the time um and doing all these things and so I I appreciate your message too because I have also noticed that it really helps to just live by example and just share from wherever people are willing to come with you at, no matter if their background is they're a doctor or science or just a family wanting to be healthy or somebody with a disease or an issue. Um, and I think that helps tremendously to just get them started. I'm the same. Like if I can just get them doing sunrise and making their nights dark, they're already going to see such huge profound effects that I don't have to add on cold plunges and all these other things sometimes that can create that overwhelming list. Um, if you can just get them outside more and spending time with their kids outside more, um, you know, I tell a lot of my friends, like whatever you want to do that you're doing inside, just try doing it outside. Like if you're reading a book, go read a book outside. If you're working on your computer, go work on it outside. If you're eating, go eat outside <laughs> and you're getting that free time without thinking like, oh, I have to schedule outside time. No, just go do whatever you're doing outside. <laughs> um, and that helps too. It's just a very simple message. And again, people might be like, like I did when I first saw Jim, like, is that really going to work? But they do it and they feel the results and they keep going, you know, and they either come back for more, which is great, or they're able to live a good, healthier life just by making those small changes. You know, I, I compare light exposure and light in general to training. It, it is like, I, I hate marathons, but if you were going to run a marathon, it wouldn't be wide wise to just go run a marathon or if you wanted to bench 300 pounds it wouldn't be wise to just put 300 pounds on the bench and try and bench it you do push-ups and rows and, and dumbbell presses and you work on your triceps and you work on your technique the same with running a marathon you run smaller distances to build yourself up for the big distance and nature is set up in the same way when it comes to sunlight the morning sun is like running your short distances to prepare you for a marathon. 
it prepares your skin for the stress of the afternoon sun so that you can make more vitamin D in that period of time, handle that stress. And then the evening sun is also a healing part of the spectrum and it helps you wind down before you go to bed. And that's the problem with the modern human. And that's, you know, and that's where it comes down to individual and what they have to do, what's best for them and their family. And that's where it gets sticky and complicated. Because for me, you know, in 2008, if you would have told me I had to quit training people inside in a gym, I wasn't ready. There's no way I would have walked away from being inside, even if I'd had that information. I wasn't ready for that. I had to go through the process of learning how to manage stress and change my diet. And then I had to have another health issue where I was ready because it was such a bad health. I basically ended up getting a staph infection from a pedicure. Uh, a young lady was like, your feet are gross and no more shenanigans until you get your feet taken care of. And it's being and got pedicures. It, yeah, being a she's like, you're you're gonna get a pedicure or you're cut off. And being the male that I am, I was like, okay, dear, I'll go get a pedicure. And two days, three days later, I'm in the emergency room getting my leg uh, prepared to be amputated. Okay. And luckily they were able to save my leg. Well, what happened was is because I spent so much time inside, like I literally was at the gym at five and I didn't go home till eight or nine at night. I, I wore sunglasses. I didn't see the sun. I was having repeat infections that were like full body septic type deals. And I ran into Dr. Cruz and he pissed a lot of people off at Paleo FX by telling people they shouldn't eat a banana in November in Boston. Right. And people, it was this huge free for all. And I was like, I was watching all this. And I was like, I need to get to know that guy. So I started chatting with him and we, and I told him about what I was going through. And he's like, dude, like, you do realize the sun runs your entire immune system. Like the UV light does a lot more than just vitamin D. I mean, it regulates your immune system. It kills stuff in your blood. I mean, it, it regulates hormone production, the light in the morning. That's why you feel so amazing. That's, that's why Huberman is like, that's his number one thing. And, and he's beating it like a drum. God bless him for that. Um, I don't, you know, like I was been saying this for, I don't know how many years since I met Dr. Cruz. And, and now I'm like, oh, finally, somebody else is actually, you know, talking about this stuff too, which is great. But um, I literally fired like 70 clients. I didn't come in till 10 o'clock in the morning. And I spent my whole time outside every morning because I couldn't, I wasn't ready to get rid of my gym yet. And that was hard. I lost a lot of clients that I really cared about. And, and still to this day, I miss training them. And, and then, you know, I, I, I readjusted my entire schedule so I could spend more time outside. And then when, when, when the beer bug hit uh, and they shut my gym down for eight months, I was like, I don't want to live somewhere where, one, they can tell me what I have to put in my body and two, where they can shut my business down at any time. So I decided to move to Florida. And, uh, and now I'm able to work with Dr. Stillman so I can work from anywhere in the world. And I have some plans to build an outdoor gym at an undisclosed location um, that I'm working on right now that I'm very excited about. But um, I literally changed my entire life and walked away from 20 years of friendships and relationships because that was what's best for me. That's what I thought would give me the best chance of living a longer, healthier life. And everybody kind of has to figure out what their turning point and what their breaking point is. And I wouldn't have done that in 2008 or 2009. I wasn't ready. But I was ready to make that choice based on the knowledge that I had and that I want to live. Like I literally, like I'm only, I'm only sitting inside right now just so that you can see my face. Um, you know, it's nighttime, but I literally do all my calls outside. Like Meredith can attest to it. I sit outside in a tan through shirt with tan through shorts on. And I literally am outside from six in the morning till when the sun goes down at night. And that's the way I've set my life up. I went to Nicaragua and I spent so much time outside in the morning and I'm Scottish. I spent six to eight hours in the sun 
near the equator and didn't burn. Now, I stepped into the shade occasionally when I felt like I was getting too hot. But that's how adaptable we are. And I have a huge passion for dark-skinned people. And I'm one of the few people that I always read people and I'll, I'll get in a conversation with someone of darker skin and I'm really good at kind of reading people like who's going to punch me in the face or who's going to kind of like, you know, well, most people won't punch me in the face, but the ones that would, the ones that would, would be able to like that. The, the, one of the, one of the problems about being like a big kind of scary looking caveman is that 95% of the people will not mess with you, but that 2% that will, Oh my gosh, like you're dead, you know? So like, we won't get into that, but I always ask, I'll get in a conversation and if they seem cool, I'll be like, have you ever thought about why you're dark? And they look at me and they're like, well, that's the way God made me. I said, where did you come from? Like, where is your ancestors from? Africa. Well, why are you, why is your skin dark? Why, why am I, why is my skin light? And they just, they look at me for a second and I'm like, because you need more sun than I do. And they just, well, I hate the sun. Well, I'm sorry, but you don't because you need more. And some of them will be like, oh my gosh. Like the first time in their life, somebody said to them like, wow, I'm like a cactus living in the Arctic. So like, I like to plant seeds like that. And I'm one of the few people that could probably say that to people and get away with it. Um, but I have a huge passion for these people. Like, dark-skinned people that are living in like Canada. Like I was counseling a guy um, that I met online who was just destroying himself. He was an Indian vegan who was trying to be a weightlifter in Canada. How's that going? Uh, not good. And of course he was trying to do the same program that everyone else was on and they were just killing him. And I was like, look, dude, and so like when you're in a, a coach like me, like most people would just throw their hands up and say, this guy's hopeless. So the, the guy's Hindu. So at least I give him that. And I'm like, you do realize if you wanted to be vegan and thrive, you need to move back to India and then you need to not work in tech. You need to spend all the time outside in the sun. He goes, that makes sense. I said, look, look, let's do this. How about we sit in the sauna for an hour and a half a day? Okay. How about we cut the volume of your training by 25%? Like back to 25% of what everyone else is doing. How about you at least take, can you take, can you take a creatine supplement and branch chain amino acids? Can you at least do that for me? Can you go talk to your, whoever your guide is and in your church or whatever it is, talk to him and see if that's okay. They gave him the okay to take branch chain amino acids, a B complex and creatine. Four weeks later, he messages me. He's like, Oh my goodness. I've put on so much muscle. I feel so much better. I actually sit in the sauna for most of the day now and do my work in the sauna. And I was like, cool. And I was like, I met the person where he was. Like most people wouldn't have even like dealt with this guy. Like, oh, you're a vegan. It's hopeless. Well, let's try and do the best we can for the situation that you're in. And it's crazy how much this guy's adapted to being in a, the worst environment in the world. Um, if you just meet people where they are and say, Hey, like, let's try and do the best we can in the situation that you're at. And I was like, look, dude, like if you want to be healthy over say the next 10 to 15 years, you need to work yourself away from Edmonton, which is like in the Arctic. And you need to work yourself down towards like the equator over time. And he's like, that make totally makes sense to me. So I'm not trying to toot my own horn or anything, but it's just like, it, there's just so many people you can help just by making some very practical suggestions based on nature. Um, and it's never going to be perfect because I don't think anybody wants to go back to living like the Amish, although we might not have a choice here at some point, but um, we have to do the best we can to educate people just on how important nature is and how important light is and do it in a way that is no expectations. Here's the information, use it if you want. And if you don't, that's totally cool too. It's a great way to share. I love that you shared the story about um, darker skinned people as well and just talking to them and creating some of 
some curiosity around why you are the way that you are. Um, the whole the whole racism discussion totally changes when it's like, I need more sun. I can survive with less sun than you can. That's like the big difference between us. Even the way they're set up with their nostrils and their face is to get rid of as much heat as possible. And the way I'm set up being Scottish is my body's designed to keep heat so I don't freeze to death. Yeah. It's just a forerunner versus like a Corolla. When I share my, when I do my Light Shapes Life seminars too and teach all of the, the quantum health stuff. And of course there's science and there's, you know, biohack ideas and referrals and different things to try. And at the end, I, I really like to just get people's minds trying to reel or trying to be curious about things. And so sometimes I'll just pop out questions, um, you know, number one towards the end being like, this is something new that we're all going into and exploring. Think about all the future jobs that your kids could have of trying to change light bulbs or hospitals to go back to having solariums and um, patios where they lay out in the sun. Like think about the things that we could actually change in the future of going back to some of the patterns and the things that we did in the past. And every now and then, depending on the crowd, I do try to get my feel to and make sure that I'm not standing on too much of a political soapbox. But it came to me too, when I was learning everything with quantum health and the skin colors of it's a light story. It's not a political story. It's not even a religious story. Um, and sometimes I will bring up at the end when I'm just kind of popping questions out there of like, how quickly could racism go away if we were teaching kids in elementary school that skin color is a light story, that your friend has genes that come out of Africa and they're darker colored skin because that body needs more sun than you do. And the, yeah, and the reason you have sickle cell anemia is to protect you from malaria. Yeah. You know, like it's, how easy could that switch just happen? Now, granted, most people are definitely very quiet after they hear that, but I know that I have planted that seed and that curiosity to where maybe somebody knows a teacher, or maybe somebody can start teaching their kids that and they spread it around. And it's just, those are the really great ideas to just still get curious about. And us as practitioners or coaches to just place that stuff out there and then see what ripples and what effects come out of it. That is my number one goal that I have when I interact with people is to make them think. I will say really silly things. Like I'll just randomly walk up to somebody in a store and I'd be like, those are really nice sunglasses you have on. Um, do you realize that it tells your brain that it's midnight, like nighttime right now? Do you realize that? And they'll look at me for a second and I'll smile. Have a nice day. I'll walk away. <laughs> yeah. I <shared laughs> it's just, just silly. Like, I don't do it like out of like, <clears throat> I'm not trying to like, you know, um, make anybody mad, but every I've had three or four people like, what do you mean? Please explain that to me. And then I've had other people look at me like I've got a horn growing out of the side of my head, which I probably do. But I, I always, I want people to think for themselves and if they can't, then it is what it is, but uh, you know, I, I just, I really, really, really try in a loving way to make people just kind of like rattle them just enough that maybe they can break out of the, 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 the days that they're in of the mindless scrolling and the, the indoctrination and, you know, all the, everything that they're doing to divide us in as many ways as possible to just get people to think about simplicity and about nature and about getting back to being an authentic human being which is oh, yeah. unfortunately the exact opposite of what is being pushed today people love the simplicity of um i had some new horse clients there today some um older generations i think they were in like their 60s and i had mentioned something about light but they're curious people you know like they still wanted to learn a lot about horses and learn things and so they had lots of questions so it was great to hang out with them and we were kind of just talking about light stuff. And I was like, okay, how do I make this like super quick and simple? I got to go to my next appointment. Um, but they had like a little garden with some blueberry bushes and some fruit trees and stuff. And I said, okay, I said to grow those fruit trees over there, what did you need? And you know, okay, we used a seed or we had a sapling. Okay, you put it in the ground. What did the tree need to be able to grow and flourish? Well, water, sunlight, and of course plants need, you know, sugar for photosynthesis. And so I was like, okay. And I was like, well, what would happen if you put a tarp over that tree all the time, all day, every day? Well, why would we do that? 
well, I mean, just, you know, what would happen? Well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't grow. It would die. <laughs> it needs the sunlight and it needs rain. I said, okay, what are clothes? What are sunglasses? And that's all I say, like, just kind of funny. And I just leave it at that. I'm not telling them what to do. I'm not telling them what I think. Just asking questions, simple, thought provoking, common sense questions. And they go, huh. <laughs> well, I, 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 use the, I, use the, I use the analogy all the time. I don't know if I got it from Jack or not, but, you know, like, if you plant a plant and it doesn't grow, do you blame the plant or do you blame the environment the plant's in? Yeah. And, and, and I'll, I'll tell that to people all the time and it'll be like, well, you know, my kids got this problem or they've got this issue or, you know, of course the hot, the hot ones, ADD. And I'll be like, well, how much time does your kid spend on time playing? Well, you know, they get, they walk, you know, they walk outside to the car. <laughs> you know, it's like, are you going to blame the kid because they sit inside in a box all day? Like I can't, sits like I used to be a teacher and one of the most rowdy reckless environments is like a teacher staff meeting you got like 25 adult juvenile delinquents in a room like throwing things at each other like the teachers can't even sit still like how do you expect a 10 or 11 year old kid to sit still for eight hours staring at like a box Mm -hmm. It's nuts what we're doing to children and getting to people to be like, maybe it's the fact that they're indoors all day and they don't spend any time outside. That's the problem. And not the fact that, you know, there's something wrong with the kid, you know, it's just hard for people to shift that mindset. Right. It, it, it forces them to have to think, think out of the box, like, Oh, maybe I have to do some things that are, a little out of the ordinary to ensure that my child is set up to be successful. Right. And that comes down to individual responsibility. And unfortunately, um, a lot of people don't want individual responsibility. They just want to exist with as little effort as possible. Yeah. Cause we don't have any more dopamine left. <laughs> that's correct. We can get into that rabbit hole too. Yeah, that's a whole other podcast, probably. Have we talked ourselves out, Meredith? Yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> what Jim Laird and I are good at, I mean, we could keep going. <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, it's very true. I can get away with a lot more, like, with the sunglasses story than most people can. But, you know, I also got to understand, like, I bounced in nightclubs for almost 20 years. So I am really, really good at reading people, like, who I can, like, joke with and who I can like kind of poke and who I can't do that with. Yeah, like I, I remember I re- real quick. <laughs> I remember my, my former business partner, Molly, I remember we were, we had an orientation and we had somebody come in that was like really sick, like was diabetic. And I basically like, was the fire and brimstone preacher. Cause like I got the vibe from the guy that he needed somebody to say like, stop drinking 30 beers a day. Like that is killing you like beers and Coke. Like that was his diet. And I was just like, you need to get outside and walk. You need to, you know, like you're killing yourself. Like, why don't you just like, I, I, I mean, this is going to sound bad, but I told him, I said, you're torturing. Like the guy was having his fingers cut off and his toes cut off. His wife actually brought him in to talk to me. And I was like, look, dude, like you're torturing your children. You're being cut to pieces. Why don't you just do it? Like, if you're going to kill yourself, do it right. You know, like just get it over with. And like Molly literally, like, I thought she was going to like, she's like, oh my gosh, what did you just say? And like (laughs) two weeks later, the guy called me and he's like, you know what? You're right. I'm, I'm going to quit drinking. I don't know what happened to the guy, but he, he called me and he said, thank you. And the wife thanked me. She's like, that's exactly what he needed to hear. Thank you so much. And I, I, I'm lucky I got that one right. An hour later, we had this other lady that came in who was an absolute metabolic disaster. Like, if you see that cartoon character that's like a giant ball with little tiny legs, this poor lady had like 17 autoimmune diseases. And she came in and she's like, I don't know what to do. And I just put my arm around her and I let her cry. 
and I, I don't know why I'm able, I'm able to do that. Like that I can judge. I'm just very glad that I have that gift. I've always had that gift of knowing like who needs like me to tell them like stop being stupid. And then who needs me to tell them it's going to be okay. It's all right. You're going to make it. Let's just start with some simple things, you know, and she ended up improving. I, I don't know what happened to her, but she worked out with me for two or three years and she lost a lot of weight. It was, it was very challenging, but she got a lot of peace out of it. And we made some really nice, significant changes with her. But, you know, I think in the health and wellness industry, you've got these people like Goggins and God bless them. We need people like Goggins that are like, you've got broken feet. You just have to keep pushing, right? And then you've got people on the other extreme that are like, it's okay. You're 300 pounds overweight, but you're empowered and there's nothing wrong with being obese. Like you should accept yourself the way you are, right? And there needs to be some fluidity there. Like there needs to be some grace and there needs to be, once again, I'll get back to the Bible. Um, for every season, turn, turn, turn. There's a season, turn, turn, turn. A season for love, a season for hate. A season for war, a season for peace. It's a song by the birds called Turn, Turn, Turn. And um, there just isn't enough of that. It's so polarizing. And it's unfortunate that people can't adapt the message to, like, I, Louis Simmons. And we'll get into my powerlifting background. Louis Simmons, West Side Borbal. One badass mother. Like I saw Louie, we were driving in a truck. I'm going to tell you the other side of my life. We we're driving down the truck and, and somebody asked Louis Simmons, how long, Louie talked like this. He's like, how long you been on steroids, Lou? Lou was like in his fifties or sixties. He's like, ah, I've been on steroids since I was 25. Pulls out a syringe out of his glove box and jams it into his leg and injects himself with testosterone. Oh my God. All right. We're, we'll go to West side and West side's an invitation only barbell. Like, uh, club if you don't bench 500 pounds you don't even go in west side like you don't you get invited to west side and you're not like public is not allowed in west side barbell like these are some of the nastiest it's like going to it's like a combination between a religious revival a tattoo parlor mm -hmm. and uh prison like literally you fear for your life when you go in there like there's blood shooting out of people's noses <laughs> people are sniffing ammonia um, guys are taking like amphetamines before they train. It's insane. Like this is a, a different side of me. I've got a few sides. <laughs> Here's these guys. We're listening to like DMX and they're like swearing and punching. We got a fight breakout. 12 year old gymnast walks in. But he's like, guys, everybody pipes down. This 12 year old little girl walks in this big, 260 pound dude with tattoos all over his body turns into just like the kindest, sweetest man and talks to her and walks her through some different exercises she needed to do for her shoulders. Here's a guy that just jammed a syringe into his leg in front of a whole bunch of dudes in a truck. Hour and a half later, is walking a 12 year old girl through how to do gymnastics rings and making her feel like a princess. That was one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. It, it's, and it's, it's sad more people just can't be like that. You definitely hold that. You're able to like hold. I can't. I mean, I put my foot in my mouth a lot. You know, it's my mouth's no. pretty big. <laughs> no. But, but, you know, I, I just wish, I just wish in this space there'd be a little more empathy and a little less, a little more meeting people where they are as opposed to like a little less dictatorship. Yeah, a little less Because so many people that are hurting that just need someone to say, hey, don't worry about anything else. Just go outside in the morning. Just start with that. Just yeah. start with. Just walk 10 minutes three times a day. Do that for a month, then we'll talk again. Yeah. Did you do that? No, I didn't. Well, don't call me back until you walk three times a day for 10 minutes. And 
I mean, we, we need, we need more of that because there's so many people that are lost. There's so many people that are disconnected. I, I, what did I read the other day? There's like, is it 20% of women under the age of 25 have attempted suicide? Yeah, we got major issues. And you really think that number would be that high if those girls were like going to the park and spending time outside instead of flipping through their Instagram and their TikTok? Yeah. You know, if they had an adult, like a mentor, like a parent or somebody that said, hey, let's go to the park. Let's just play. Put your phone down. Let's just play. Let's just simple. That's what we need. We need more of that. We need more people to lead by example and to like set the example instead of like judging people because, you know, they're, you know, where they live or they're not, they're not willing to like, you know, go live on a, a farm somewhere or move halfway around the world and leave their family. Yeah. Um, we need more of like meeting people where they're at. Yeah, that's a good message and a good way to wrap this up. Um, it's like, it's almost past my bedtime. That's why you're getting so silly. I like it. I was like, oh, it's past his bedtime. <laughs> but I definitely it's appreciated the bedtime. impersonations and I hadn't heard that story in all the 20 years I've known you. So I appreciated that. I we have, have you know, there's a, like, that's the thing of like, I'll say this in closing. Well, we have two questions we have to handle okay. and close. Okay. So one of them is directed to you. Okay. For Jim, what difference do you see working clients outside compared to inside Jim? And I know, at least in my personal experience, too, even though I know the question's not anchored towards me, but I just have a little gym here in my backyard and I work barefoot doing kettlebells and weights and doing some sprints up and down the backyard. And I love it. The sun's shining on me. I sweat. I save money, which is awesome. Um, and it just feels really good to be outside jamming the music and just doing my thing. And I know there's plenty of health benefits. Again, I'm doing something that I could be doing inside, but I'm doing it outside and the benefits are going to compound a hundred times, which I'm sure you can share now with your clients. It's definitely very beneficial, but it's very hard to do. Um, especially like here in Florida, like, even though like it's so hot and then in Kentucky, the weather is so crappy. So what I always did, like, I love working out outside and I would do it in the winter in Kentucky. And there's videos of me on my Instagram dragging the sled with no shirt on in 30 degree weather. But the majority of people aren't going to do that. So I use the gym kind of as my pulpit. And I, I had doors and I opened the doors unless it was like stupid cold. I would use the gym as like they'd come in three times a week. And I'd be talking about you need to walk outside. The gym I'm opening. Um, I don't, I don't want to say where it's going to be yet, but it's literally on the beach and it has like a 15 mile an hour wind off the beach all day. It's 85 degrees year round. So it's going to have like a, a thatched roof. It's going to be like similar to Tulum Jungle Gym in Tulum, except it's not going to be in Tulum. But all the equipment's going to be made out of wood and sand and stone. And like that's, I love training people, but I don't want to be a zoo animal. But like the gym I'm training people at in St. Pete right now, they've got giant doors. So it's great. I get natural light, you know, just the mood of people in general. But in the fitness industry now with modern humans being, you know, unless you're doing like a move nap thing or something like that, most people are not going to want to go roll around in the grass or in the sand or whatever. So I, for me, when I train outside, it feels so much better. But I also like to use some things like Dr. Stillman and I go work out a couple of times a week for like an hour in the gym. And there's nowhere around here where we can use the machines and the equipment that's outdoors. So we kind of like, that's a trade-off. We like, okay, we can handle, you know, we spend most of our time out here working on, on the patio. We can handle <clears throat> three hours a week, you know, in artificial lights, unfortunately. But, um, but I mean, the more you can work out outside, the better, like, it's just like Jackie said, like everything, whether it's working on your computer, even if it's just opening the window, like the more natural light you can get in your life, the better. But, um, my, my, my goal, like I want to still, I want to train people to the day I die, which could be next week or next month or 20 years from now. I don't know. Um, but I'll, I'll uh, I'll say one thing about myself that most people don't really know about me. Um, and then I'll let Jackie talk about, um, 
The next question. About about her horse, her horse, how she incorporates quantum into the horsey stuff. But when in like the mid 2000s, you know, they asked Olympians like, if you were given a drug where you would win a, like every gold medal for like six months, but you would die in a year, would you take it? 90% of them said yes. I used to be that guy. I was willing to sacrifice my life to squat a thousand pounds. Like that was me. That was my mindset. Like I was, I did not care about consequences of health. I took all sorts of different substances. I trained like an absolute maniac. I didn't train my, I didn't train my clients like that. I mean, I did a thousand pound chain suspended good morning and blood shot all over my, the wall. Right. So I've been at that mindset where like my life doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is lifting heavier weights and being as big and strong as possible. So I understand that part of it. I fought in MMA. I fought in combat. I've been in so many fights, I can't even count. So I have that side of me that's like this guy that I keep locked away in the basement. I call him Mr. J, right? He's only allowed out in emergency situations because he feels no pain. He has no empathy and he destroys everything that he touches. So he's locked in the basement, right? We have a deal. And then the other side of me that comes from working with children, being a school teacher, having empathy. So I have both sides of the extreme. I know what it's like to have to like, if you're playing in the NFL, it's not about your health. It's about money. It's about winning, right? You're, you know, when you're trying to be a professional bodybuilder, it's not about your health. It's about getting as big as possible. I get that mindset. And I've also had to be on the other side of it because I've had my life on the line where I've had to get in touch with nature, get back in, in, in touch with reality and have empathy and have mercy on people and meeting people where they're at. So I have a really, I'm almost like bipolar when it comes to that. Right. And, and a lot of people haven't been on both sides of that coin. Like I have. So I've seen uh, and experienced a lot more things than most people have, which I am grateful for because it allows me to relate to just about anyone from the CEO who's destroying his health through his work or the extreme CrossFit athlete who's, you know, ripped his trap off his shoulder blade doing 300 snatches and 7 million box jumps to, you know, the woman who's got 17 autoimmune diseases who cries herself to sleep at night because she's in so much pain. It, I, it's, I'm very grateful for my life experience so that I can help a wide variety of people and empathize with them. Great message. That was good. <laughs> um, horses, really. horses. How do you incorporate quantum into your horses? Jackie, how have you incorporated quantum biology into your horse work? So great question. And thank you for including that. Um, actually, my mind was always reeling after I got into the quantum health light stuff. So if statistics are saying that humans are spending 93% of our time indoors, most people are not thinking about, well, what about our animals? A lot of people have dogs and cats at home. Um, and so those animals are staying indoor more as, as well. And if we do get into like the Wi-Fi and the 5G and all that, they're also getting exposed to that radiation during the day if we're not yeah. shutting off. And they're a lot more, they're a lot more sensitive to that than we are. Oh, yeah. so animals are much more sensitive beings, which is something I've even learned before getting into all of this information. Um, horses, even most people are like, you work on horses, you must be so strong and have to do all this. Horses can feel a fly land on them. So they're super sensitive, sentient beings. And most people would think if you're not in the horse industry, or even if you are like horses must always be outside They're horses, the majority of sport horses and horses that are owned now as pets, like they're in a barn and they're in a stall more often than not more hours of the day than they're outside, which is really sad because these animals, wild horses travel up to 30 miles a day. And they so don't even let, they don't even let him play anymore. But yeah. that's why, so that's why they're so fragile. Yeah, they they come out of their stalls to work for an hour or two in an arena, in a collected frame, very forced, very unnatural, um, and then go back into that stall to stand and not move all that tissue and lactic acid and stuff around. And we are creating weaker sport horses, weaker sport animals, 
Um, and so some things that I am currently doing already in my current work, I already try to now talk to my clients about what's your turnout like for your horses? You know, are you doing a proper warm up and cool down? Are you actually just going out and hacking them around on a trail ride for a couple of hours for the day? Are you making sure they actually get out in the middle of the day for the UV light? Cause they need it just as strongly as we do. Um, and so I am trying to incorporate a lot of that in my current business model, but I am actually creating a second business that's hopefully eventually going to take over. Um, so I am creating some quantum health products for horses and dogs, um, and hopefully going to be able to start producing research and science and data behind it too. There's not a ton of it, but there's enough information. For example, like I've been starting to read up on research of dogs and we have a ton of problems with dogs having anxiety and being put on antidepressant medications and dying of like crazy ass cancers that did not exist 20 years ago. And so what has changed? Like their diet really hasn't changed that much. The water is not that bad. Like it's the light, you know, they're not ever getting outside. They can't make, they can make their own vitamin D just like we do, but they need cholesterol just like we do to make the vitamin D. And you can only get that from the UV connection in the middle of the day. It's the cholesterol in the system and the horses are the same. So I'm hoping to be able to start producing that information um, along with the products that I'm going to make for both horse and rider. Um, and if anybody that ends up listening to this phone call has any type of connections with engineering, uh, fabric design, or angel investors, <laughs> look me up and contact me because I'm going to need all of those things in the future. So that's my little plug. Um, but yes, I am going to hopefully help horse riders, animals, horses, and dogs in the future on a quantum health style. You know, it's interesting to, to tell a story about about dogs, and um, you know, I've I've had um, three three dogs uh, live to eighteen, nineteen, and one lived to twenty, and I've got my thirteen uh, year old uh, pit bull Rommel. That's one thing Michelle Lee and I share is our love of pit bulls, and uh, um, I don't know why she loves them, but I love them because they're a lot like me. Um, but he's 13 years old. We play an hour and a half of catch every day. He's ridiculous. And we went to the vet. And of course I was spoiled. And if you're in Lexington, there's a lady named Jen Rankin, who's an incredible vet who actually gave me Rommel. He had been hit by a car when, before I got him and she did the surgery on him. If, if I would take him and, and I've had him ever since, but um, we walked in and the lady started lecturing me on me abusing my dog. And I said, what are you talking about? She's like, your dog is way underweight. And she's like, you need to feed him more. He's too skinny. I was like, well, you know, dogs, you're supposed to be able to see their ribs just barely. She's like, no, that's not right. I'm like, well, with all due respect, like all you see is fat dogs all day. Like this is what an animal, like a wolf or a coyote, if you take their coat down, like, this is what they look like. Trust me, I grew up on a farm. I've shot plenty of them. Um, this is what they look like when they eat, you know, Rommel eats sardines, eggs, a can of pumpkin a day, and, like, beef liver and, like, real food. He eats, like, steak when I'm eating steak. And, you know, he's super active. And she starts lecturing me on all these tests he needs to run. And I've never – my my dogs, all the dogs I've had, because they live outdoor lives – um, the number of times I've been to the vet, I can count on one hand and the lady was being really rude. And I just said to her, I said, ma'am, I said, look, I came here for two vaccines so I could board my dog. I'm not interested in your healthcare plan. I'm not interested in you telling me that my dog is not healthy. I don't want you to fix my dog's teeth. I don't want you to clean their teeth. Um, and she goes, well, you know, this year you're being, I'm going to report you. And I said, ma'am, how many dogs have you had live over the age of 18? She's like, none. I said, when you have one, I've had, well, I've had three and he's 13 years old. He could run circles around any dog in here. When you have one reach 18, you call me and then you can give me advice about how to raise an animal. And it was just ridiculous. Like this poor lady, I felt so bad for her. Because all she sees all day are these like eight-year-old Labradors or Labradoodles or Boodle Doodles with blown out ACLs because they all sit inside all day and eat like crap. And I go to the dog park and half the dogs run, run, do run, run. And then they sit under the tree for like three days 
And Rommel's doing like, you know, all these passes and people are like, how old is he? And I'm like, he's 13 years old. And they're like, oh my gosh, he's awful skinny for, he's skinny, but man, he sure runs. And I'm like, yeah, he's normal. Like one more story and then we'll shut it down. It was funny because, you know, I'm really good friends with Rob Wolf. And, you know, Rob is doing an incredible job homeschooling his children. He's got two daughters and, you know, he, he basically raised them on real food, you know, breastfed, you know, lots of real food. And it's funny when they would go to the doctor, they were like extremely underweight, but they were on the upper percentile of everything like height and motor development and everything when compared to the average American baby. When you compared Rob's children to the rest of the world standard, they were normal. So our society has made illness for not only pets, but humans normal. Like when people come back and like my blood works normal, I'm like, I'm not good. <laughs> it's like that's, that's normal. His they've they've made sick normal, which is which is not good. But um, did you want to say anything in wrapping it up? Um, I just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity, Meredith. Thank you for being here with me, Laird. It's always fun to collaborate with you. So this was super awesome. Um, I hope to be back again for another interview, maybe with some of the animal stuff when I'm ready, because I think people would probably enjoy that. Um, and please feel free to contact me if anybody has any questions on what we discussed tonight. And thank you for your hour and a half of letting us share our lives and our confessionals <laughs> and also our journey. I hope that it hopes, I hope that it ripples and affects somebody out there. So thank you. And Kathleen, to answer your question, I think you said, will the gym be like a retreat setting or certain times a year? No, we will. Dr. Stillman and I will be doing some retreats at this location, probably in the new year to help raise revenue to build this facility. But the, this, this facility is on one of the number one surfing beaches in Central South America. And right now they cater mainly to surfers. And I saw the opportunity to come in and to develop like a gym to draw a different type of crowd there. So the gym, once it's built, which in Latin America is like, when you spend time in Latin America, everything's like manana, tomorrow, tomorrow. So, you know, when you start a project in Latin America, like I talked to this, the CEO of this company that's been in existence for 26 years in this resort, has been there for 25 years. Um, and they develop the wonderful relationship with the community. Like all the food is locally grown. It's unbelievable. Um, he's like, dude, you're going to move down here and you're going to build a gym. Just like eat like 20 extra patients pills a day because like you're going to have setbacks that you could never imagine in your life. But so the, the shorter answer is, is we are going to be doing a retreat at this resort, like a wellness style retreat. Dr. Stillman and I are probably going to be doing a number of those next year, depending on what's going on in the world. Um, and then hopefully, I'm hoping within a year, I can have a facility up and going. And it's going to be the kind of place where you'll be able to come and like spend a couple of weeks and buy all your food from local farmers and ride horses on the beach and tennis and golf. You'll be about 45, 50 minutes from the main city. And you literally walk out your front door and get in the ocean. And like, we're talking 15 miles of private beach, like where there's nobody but the locals. Like, it's awesome. So I'm super excited about that. Um, if you ever wanted to ask me more questions or hear me rant, I might, you know, about all sorts of different things. Dr. Stillman and I on Substack do a monthly Q&A. Um, it's just like a subscription where Dr. Stillman writes all the things that he would get kicked off the internet for saying uh, on his Substack. If you go to my on my Instagram, you go to the link on my link tree. There's a link there to the Substack. If you want to answer, you know, ask me more questions in the future. I really appreciate Meredith being on here, and I really uh, I don't know whose idea this was, but it was just fun getting on here with Jackie, and and uh, I'm I'm really glad we were able to both share our stories and. You know, hopefully, you know, people can learn that this is a process that never ends. And as long as you're alive, you know, you're always trying to evolve and to get better. And to and but, you know, in the long run, when you get yourself in trouble, always simplify, always sit quietly, always get back to nature, because that in the end is what it's all about. Silence, being calm and peaceful and getting in touch with nature. That's who we are as human beings. And in our modern world, we're going to have to make a deliberate choice.
to have a relationship with nature or it's not going to be a good outcome for you. Um, and we just, we just got to continue to spread this message that, you know, even if it's five minutes, a couple times a day, just start where you are, get outside, be more active, you know, be more present. And um, yeah, appreciate you having me on. And thanks everyone for all the questions. This has been the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast. To find a practitioner who practices from this point of view, visit our directory at quantumbiologycollective.org. If you are a practitioner, definitely take a look at the Applied Quantum Biology Certification, a six-week study of the science of the new human health paradigm and its practical application with your patients and clients. We also love to feature graduates of the program on this very podcast. Until next time, the QBC.